Since I uploaded the Optiplex Buyer's Guide, people have left comments on that video about how I'm way off base on the second and third gen CPUs, saying that there's little to no performance difference. So I decided to compare the best locked i5 and i7 from the second, third, and fourth gen processors to, you know, get an idea of how they improve generationally and if it really matters that much from a gaming perspective. While I am testing these from the perspective of how they perform in an Optiplex, these results still apply to these CPUs regardless, including the lock SKUs, all things being equal. Now there's a lot of info to cover here, and if you like benchmarking graphs, man, this is the video for you. But first, for the sake of transparency, we need to talk about the hardware as well as the testing methodology. First and foremost, this is a CPU comparison, so let's look at the CPUs we're testing with. Starting with the second gen, we'll be testing the i5-2500 and the i7-2600. From the third gen, we'll be testing the i5-3570 and the i7-3770. And last, the fourth gen with the i5-4690 and the i7-4790. We'll be testing those using this open-air test bench, using the respective motherboards from the Optiplex 990, 9010, and 9020. I'm using the same 16GB set of SK Hynix DDR3 clocked at 1600MHz for all of my testing. However, keep in mind that the 990 can only run that memory at 1333MHz max. This is just a limitation of the 990 series boards. Our test bench is using a 250GB Samsung 860 EVO for the OS and the games are running off of a 1TB Samsung 860 QVO. The power supply is a Corsair CX750M, which, as you might guess, is a 750 watt unit. And since I was going to be swapping around CPUs, I decided to use a graphite pad for the thermal interface under the same stock cooler. The idea here is to limit the amount of variables by keeping as many things as consistent between tests as we can. And of course, we're going to need some GPUs. I tested several, starting with this uh, Asus Strix RX 460 4 gig. Now, I chose this primarily as a base of comparison, you know, a control if you will, since we know that none of these CPUs are going to bottleneck this GPU. I also tested using the MSI Armor Mark II RX 578GB, as well as the PowerColor Red Devil RX 588GB. From the NVIDIA side, we have the EVGA 1060 SSC 6GB model, the 1650 Super 4GB, the 1070DT 8GB, the 1080DT 8GB, and lastly, the 1080Ti for the Win 3 11GB. As far as testing is concerned, I'll be starting with a couple of synthetics, being Cinebench R20 for the CPUs and Heaven for the GPUs. I tested in six games starting with CSGO. This was meant to test uh, in a CPU bound scenario to show how these CPUs improve generationally. Next, I used Doom because I wanted to test a game that's highly optimized. After that, Far Cry 5 because it's more optimized for clock speeds and can be particularly sensitive to memory latency as well. After that, I tested in Battlefield 5 for its excellent ability to exploit CPU bottlenecks. Then I tested in Battlefront to give these older CPUs the best possible chance and to show the difference in game engine optimization. And the last game that I tested with was Call of Duty Modern Warfare because I wanted to test in multiple APIs and Modern Warfare has a decent implementation of DirectX 12. I also wanted to test in something fairly recent. Now, I did all of my testing with the settings maxed out, save for CSGO, which I ran with the settings bottomed out. All tests were run with film grain and motion blur disabled, as they should be. And why max out the settings? Well, I simply wanted to try and leverage the GPU as much as possible to give these CPUs their best chance. And yeah, I know, uh, maxing out the settings is going to be a bad time for any of these cards with the 4GB uh, VRAM buffer. But we'll talk about that later when we get to performance. Also, all the benchmarks were run multiple times for consistency, and then I used the median score. To do the benchmark testing and to get the overlay to show our various stati uh, statistics, I used MSI Afterburner and Riva Tuner. Lastly, I want to mention that I'm doing all testing with the Spectre and Meltdown fixes disabled using GRC's Inspector tool, and all three will be linked down in the description. Anyways, let's jump into testing, starting with our synthetics. In Cinebench, we can see how these CPUs increase in processing power generationally. Now, Intel employed the tick-tock strategy with these CPUs, 
the talk being a change in microarchitecture with tick being a die shrink. Sandy Bridge was a talk with a big performance increase over the first gen. Ivy Bridge was a tick being an optimization of the second gen, where we should see about a 5% increase over Sandy Bridge. Likewise, being another talk, Haswell should see about a 10% increase from the third gen. However, that's not what we're seeing here. Looking at our single core performance, we see about an 8% increase going from the second to third gen, and going from the third gen to fourth gen, we see about a 16% increase. Looking at the multi-core performance, we see a gain of about 10% from the second to third gen, and around 20% increase uh, moving up to the fourth gen. Now, let's look at how these CPUs did in heaven, which is designed to be a GPU benchmark, so we should see pretty similar performance here. Starting with the RX 460, we see absolutely no difference between each of these CPUs. Going to the 570, we're seeing around a 1% increase going from the 2nd to 4th gen, and we're seeing the same marginal increase moving up to the RX 580. Shifting over to NVIDIA with the 1060, we see about a 3% increase from the 2nd to 4th uh, gen, but with the 1650 Super, we're seeing less than a 1% increase being effectively the same. We see the same trend with the 1070. I'm not really sure why there was a slight dip with the third gen, but this is less than a 1% drop and isn't a meaningful difference. The trend continues with the 1080, and the results look practically the same. And lastly, with the 1080 Ti, we see a slight increase of about 1.5% from the second to fourth gen. So, do any of these numbers actually correlate to gaming performance? I don't know, we'll have to see when we get to look at all those glorious benchmarking graphs. But first, let's talk about bottlenecks. So I have to say that I've learned a lot about this subject over the last month, and I just want to start by saying this is, this is just a very convoluted and nebulous subject. Trying to measure CPU to GPU bottlenecks is difficult due to the sheer amount of variables that there are, and they vary from game engine to game engine. Now, most people seem to agree that it's defined as an increase in CPU utilization uh, above around 90%, and a correlating drop in GPU utilization somewhere south of 90%. But I found that's potentially a flawed way to measure it, and I'll elaborate towards the end of bottleneck testing. Anyways, let's take a look at the utilization figures. All right, so I'm just gonna start with our baseline test using the i5-2500 and the RX 460. And since we've got a ton of information to cover here, I'm just gonna be brief and say that there were zero bottlenecks in any of those runs, as if any of us should be surprised. While there were GPU utilization dips here and there, this can be normal depending on the game. And you can't necessarily always expect the GPU to sit at 100% usage 100% of the time while gaming. Also, please do not compare these results to my testing from the GPU selection video. I'm not testing with the same settings, so they're not comparable. And this is gonna take some time, but things do get particularly interesting when we hit those higher end GPUs. Anyways, starting off with the RX 570 and Far Cry 5, with all three i5s, the 570 stayed effectively fully utilized. It's worth noting that the CPU usage dropped as we climbed the stack, kind of the trend we'll see throughout the tests. Anyways, there's nothing indicating a bottleneck here. With the i7s, you can see that the CPUs have a lot more headroom, and they're obviously not bottlenecking the 570. Also, because the CPU usage is lower, they're more apt to hit their rated boost speeds than their i5 counterparts. Moving on to Battlefield 5, and we're already seeing the 2500 maxing out a couple of times, as did the 3570. The 4690 also kind of gets close, but all three mostly had a decent buffer zone on the CPU for most of the run. The 570 managed to stay effectively maxed out on all three. With the 2500 and 3570, there were a couple of GPU usage dips that correlated with CPU spikes, and could be considered a very slight bottleneck, where I'm not seeing any potential bottleneck on the 4690. Nothing has changed here with the i7s, not that I expected it to. The 570 is staying maxed out, however, we don't see the i7s boosting quite as high since Battlefield is hitting the CPUs a little harder than Far Cry 5 was. Still, there's plenty of headroom and obviously no bottleneck. Next, in Battlefront, we see that there's no sign of a bottleneck with the 570 on any of the i5s, mainly because it was designed to run on this hardware. And on all three, we have plenty of headroom on CPU usage. But we are talking about a five-year-old game here. With the i7s, the CPU usage is now so low that we're 
we're regularly hitting our max boost speeds, and obviously no bottlenecks. Lastly, in Modern Warfare, all three i5s did pretty well. The 2500 and 3570 both peaked into the upper 90s, where the 4690 only peaked into the upper 80s. At no point were there any usage drops on the 570 that lined up with CPU usage spikes. Moving up to the i7s, we see similar behavior to what we saw in Far Cry 5. There's nothing remotely resembling a bottleneck. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the i7s again until we get to the 1070s, since the results here are really the same for the 580, 1060, and 1650 Super. Anyways, bumping up to the RX 580 in Far Cry 5, the story hasn't changed much for the i5s. We're seeing pretty much the same results where the 2500 and the 3570 effectively maxed out at one point, but the 4690 kept it under 90%. However, at no point did the 580 have a drop in GPU usage that corresponded with a CPU spike, so no observed bottlenecks here. In Battlefield 5, we get similar results as the 570 with the 2500 and 3570 maxing out again and a corresponding drop in GPU usage, with the bottleneck being slightly more pronounced. The 4690 also managed to max out at one point, but it wasn't accompanied by a GPU usage drop, so we're not really seeing a bottleneck there. Back to Battlefront, and we're seeing pretty similar results to the 570 as well. All three i5s managed to keep the 580 maxed out with nothing even approaching a bottleneck. The story changes slightly in Modern Warfare. Both the 2500 and 3570 hit the limit with an observed GPU usage drop on the 580 as a result. The 2600 is starting to become a clear bottleneck with the 3570 being right on the edge. The 4690, however, is still sitting pretty, never going above 90% and there's no bottleneck to speak of. Hopping in the 1060 and loading up Far Cry 5, our results aren't much different here from the 580. All three i5s had spikes into the upper 90s, but regardless, the 1060 effectively stayed pegged, and we're not seeing any bottlenecks here. Things really take a turn for the 2500 in Battlefield 5, with it pretty much maxed out for the duration of the run. The 3570 had a better time here, also maxing out, but not staying there. The 4690 did have a spike to 99%, but was mostly in the 80s. Surprisingly, the 1060 manages to stay maxed out on all three. However, the 2500 is leaving you no buffer zone, while the 3570 is pretty close to the edge. And with the 4690, there's no observed bottleneck. In Battlefront, the results are really the same here as they were with the 570 and 580. None of these CPUs are even close to presenting a bottleneck with the 1060. The GPU remains maxed out for the duration of the run. In Modern Warfare, we're not really seeing the i5s present a bottleneck here either. The GPU is effectively staying maxed out with the 2500 getting into that zone of not having much headroom on the CPU, with the 3570 and 4690 being a bit more comfortable. On the 1650 Super and in Far Cry 5, none of these i5s are really having a problem here. There's not a lot of difference between the 2500 and 3570, with the 4690 having a much easier time with it. In Battlefield 5, the 2500 is pegged for the entire run. I don't think it dropped even once. There was no question here. The 3570 is right on the edge and isn't leaving you really any buffer zone, but the 4690 does a bit better leaving you some headroom. Once again, in Battlefront, none of the i5s are having a problem with the 1650 Super. They all have more than enough headroom and the GPU stays pretty steadily maxed out for the entirety of the run. In Modern Warfare, we're doing pretty good, with the 2500 getting regularly into the 90s and the 3570 not far behind. The 4690, however, is sitting well below the 90% range. Regardless, I'm not seeing a bottleneck here. So I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious here as we move on to the 1070. And in Far Cry 5, we get some interesting results. With the 2500, we never really see the 1070 reach 100%, but the CPU isn't pegged the entire time either. Same with the 3570 and 4690, but at least they managed to max out the 1070 at times. We're seeing similar results with the i7s, but since they're running at higher clock speeds, they're doing a bit better, with the 4790 almost able to keep the 1070 fully utilized. However, this time none of the i7s were even approaching the limit, so what gives here? After all of my research, what I believe we're seeing here is that the IPC and clock speeds are keeping the 1070 from being fully utilized. Memory might be playing a small part as well, but since the 1070 isn't being fully utilized, even the i5s are able to keep up with the demand. So is this a bottleneck? 
More on that at the end of testing. Anyways, getting into Battlefield 5, we see the traditional definition of a bottleneck. The 2500 is doing better than I expected, but I feel like its lack of IPC is also a factor here. The 3570 isn't doing much better than the 2500, but it's keeping the 1070 pretty much maxed. The 4690 is doing surprisingly better. However, it's still maxed out and we saw a GPU utilization dip. So it's a bottleneck, but just barely. Still, even then, it's not leaving you a lot of breathing room. The i7s are able to keep the 1070 fully utilized for the duration of the run. Also, you might note that the i7s are now being utilized high enough that we're just not hitting our max boost clocks anymore. Moving on to Battlefront, we're still not really seeing any bottlenecking with the i5s. Even with the 2500, you have a decent buffer zone that gets even better with each generation. And the same goes for the i7s. The 1070 is really staying fully utilized, and we're still getting decent boost behavior thanks to the lower CPU usage. And even though all these CPUs are keeping up with the 1070, the 4th gen CPUs had more consistent GPU usage thanks to that IPC boost. And in Modern Warfare, the 2500 is a pretty clear bottleneck for most of the test, with the 3570 really doing an admirable job, but still ended up bottlenecking the 1070. The 4690 only really had one spike, which might be considered a bottleneck, but it's very slight. Still, you don't have a lot of headroom at times. Moving up to the i7s, we can see that cores really do matter in Modern Warfare. The 2600 is having zero problems feeding the 1070, and obviously the same goes for the 3770 and 4790. We aren't seeing great boost behavior here, seems we're right on the edge, but the 4790 does manage to almost reach its max boost here and there. Now, there might not be much of a point continuing beyond the 1070 with the i5s, even though we know that the i5s are going to hold back the 1080 and the 1080 Ti, I thought the results were interesting and relevant regardless. In Far Cry 5, we're seeing similar results to the 1070, where the game engine just wants more clocks and more IPC. However, the 1080 is also just not going to be fully utilized at 1080p in Far Cry 5, even with a 9900K. And again, due to the GPU utilization being as low as it is, helps the i5s keep up with the demand. The i7s have plenty of breathing room, but are still having a hard time keeping the 1080 fed. The 4790 is really getting close to pushing the 1080 as much as it can be expected in this scenario, but the 2600 and 3770 are having a tough go of it. In Battlefield 5, we're seeing something similar. No question, all the i5s are bottlenecking the 1080, however, we're seeing that IPC gain really helping the 4690 bring up the 1080's utilization. It still never sees 100%, but we'd need higher clocks in IPC for that. And even the i7s are starting to feel the heat in Battlefield 5. The 2600 and 3770 can't keep the 1080 fully utilized, despite not hitting 100% themselves. But the 4790 does manage to keep the 1080's usage up around 100%. In Battlefront, the 2500 and 3570 are really struggling to keep the 1080 at 100%, and the CPUs aren't maxing out. However, the 4690 is able to keep the 1080 close to being fully utilized. Now we can see the IPC and clocks really affecting GPU usage, even in a game that was designed to run on these quad-core CPUs. Even the 2600 and 3770 aren't able to keep the 1080 fully utilized in Battlefront at this point. And once again, they're not getting anywhere close to being fully utilized. In fact, utilization is pretty much unchanged. But the 4790 comes in and has no problems here. It's really showing that Haswell's IPC gain does make a difference. In Modern Warfare, it's more of the same with the 2500 and the 3570 creating a definitive bottleneck for the 1080, and the 4690 being able to do an admirable job keeping the 1080 in the mid to upper 90% range most of the time. But there were a couple of instances where the 4690 hit 100% with the 1080's utilization dropping. Well, it is impressive, it's still a bottleneck. The 2600 is the only one struggling here, but it's not too far off, keeping the 1080 close to being fully utilized. The 3770 and 4790, on the other hand, are having no problem at all keeping the 1080 fed. Far Cry 5 sees the 1080 Ti's usage down as low as 40% with the 2500. The 3570 is a slight improvement, and the 4690 manages to improve even a little more on that, but bottleneck city from multiple angles. And it's the same story with the i7s. We just need a stronger CPU to push the 1080 Ti in Far Cry 5. 
Even though it's not going to be fully utilized in this engine at 1080p, it should still be higher than what we're seeing. Battlefield 5 is really showing more of the same, just a continued trend from the 1080, with the situation improving as we move up from the 2500 to the 4690. But obviously, not to the point where pairing any of these with the 1080 Ti makes any sense. With the i7s, the 2600 just isn't having an impact here, and the 3770 is barely having one. But the 4790 is, it's able to keep the 1080 Ti's usage higher in this continued trend where that IPC boost is making a big difference. Going to Battlefront, it's not much of a different story from the 1080 as well. Even under ideal conditions, in a game designed to run on these CPUs, all the i5s are having a tough time keeping the 1080 Ti's utilization up, with the 4690 being able to do a much better job thanks to that IPC boost. With the i7s, not even the 4790 can keep the 1080 Ti fully utilized. After doing a little testing, the 3950X in my main rig is able to keep the 1080 Ti maxed out, even at 1080p. So we are actually seeing the CPUs hold back the 1080 Ti, even in Battlefront. Modern Warfare is the same story. Nothing I can really add here without just repeating myself. However, this has really shown how well-optimized Call of Duty is considering how well the 4690 is doing. We're seeing similar results with the i7s as we did with the 1080. The 2600 isn't able to keep the 1080 Ti fully utilized, with the 3570 being close. The 4790, however, is actually able to keep that beast fed here. I've got to say, I'm just really impressed with this game engine. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What about higher resolutions? Well, with the 1070 at 1440p, the results are pretty much the same for the i5s. I would say that the 4690 is slightly better here, but not much. The i7s really aren't much different from the 1080p results either. We're simply seeing lower CPU utilization. Moving on to the 1080, and things get interesting. We see the 2500 and 3570 CPU usage go up. That's because the 1080's usage is also up, but still not 100%. However, the 4690 is doing an admirable job, and I would even dare call it usable. Not ideal, but it works. The 1080 is fully utilized and the CPU isn't constantly pegged. However, you don't have much of a buffer zone. With the i7s, we can see the decreased clocks and IPC on the 2600 still holding the 1080 back, while the 3570 and 4790 aren't having a problem. With the 1080 Ti, none of the i5s are able to keep that sucker fed at 1440p. Big surprise, but the 4690 was so close, but it was effectively maxed out the entire time. Again, we see the 2600's lower IPC and clocks preventing it from keeping pace with the 1080 Ti. However, now the 3770 is following suit. The 4790, however, is able to keep the 1080 Ti fully utilized at 1440p. In 4K, the i5s are able to keep the 1080 Ti fully utilized at 2160p, but the 2500 really doesn't have any breathing room and the 3570 isn't far behind. However, I would actually call the 4690 usable, despite the fact that this is a terrible use case. The i7s are a pretty obvious conclusion at 2160p. We are entirely GPU bound, but I will say that the 1080 Ti's usage is more solid on the 3770 and 4790. All right, so there's been some really interesting data here that's made me question referencing utilization as a strict measurement of a bottleneck. We saw time and time again where GPU utilization increased with the higher end GPUs as we went from generation to generation. And with the i7s, there was never any time where they reached their limits utilization-wise. And there wasn't much of a difference in clock speeds, at least not enough to account for that level of increased GPU usage. I feel this has more to do with the boost in IPC or instructions per cycle between these CPUs. So CPU clocks and IPC are certainly factors, regardless of utilization, leaving us to question, is this a bottleneck or not? And I believe that it definitively is. The GPU is being held back, and by increasing clocks and IPC, we can see that bottleneck alleviate. However, it doesn't end there. We also have to talk about how CPU usage can be a flawed measurement in and of itself. Now, let's say you're seeing your CPU usage reach 90%. You probably think that means that 90% of your CPU's processing capacity is being utilized. Now, that's entirely possible, but 
It's also possible that it might actually mean that only 10% of the CPU is being utilized, while 80% is waiting on information from, say, the memory, for example. This would make the memory the bottleneck in this scenario, and not the CPU. And the RAM can be affected by the memory controller, as well as its own internal timings and clock speeds. I mean, it just goes on and on. I should also mention that if you're gaming online or if you have other programs running in the background like Discord or something, it's going to eat up even more of your CPU, which is why having that buffer zone can be really important. I mean, I could keep naming off variables all day, but I don't want to get so far off into the weeds here. However, the point is that there are a lot of variables, and you can see why I originally called this convoluted and nebulous at the beginning of the video. Anyways, let's jump to the performance data with those glorious benchmarking graphs where we can get a better idea of how this all matters realistically. Starting in CSGO with 570, and we can see a steady increase in the average frame rate from one CPU to another. The 3570 is able to match the 2600 and the 4690 easily bests the 3770. As for 1% and 0.1% lows, they're pretty consistent as we're GPU limited with the 570 when we hit the smoke's particle effects in the benchmark level. The 580 is looking somewhat similar to the 570 in terms of gains from one CPU to another, but we're seeing a drop in performance on the 3770 and 4690. The 4790, on the other hand, is leaving everyone in the dust, probably thanks to it being able to boost up to 4 GHz on a regular basis. On the NVIDIA side, the 1060 has pretty similar performance to the 570, but we're seeing the 4690 fall off even a little more from the 580, and now it's barely faster than the 3770. However, the 4790 is still quite a bit faster than the other CPUs. The 1650 Super's average FPS hasn't changed much on the second gen. However, the 3770 and 4790 dropped while the 3570 and 4690 had a decent boost. With the 1070, the second gen hasn't changed much. The same goes for the 3570 and 4690. The 3770 is seeing a decent jump in performance, as is the 4790. And now we're seeing the second gen become CPU bound in the smoke sections. The 1080 is seeing similar results to the 1070 with most of the CPUs not seeing much of a change, but the 2600 got a slight boost in average FPS, while the 4690 had quite a jump. However, the 1% and 0.1% jumped quite a bit from the 1070, and we're seeing the spread on those numbers get even bigger generationally, as now the 3rd gen has become CPU bound in the smoke sections. The 1080 Ti's performance isn't really any different from the 1080, at least not a meaningful amount, save for the 3570 which got a very slight jump over the 1080 overall. And the 4th gen saw a 10 FPS jump on the 0.1% lows, but even the 4th gen is CPU bound in the smoke sections now. In Doom, we're pretty much GPU bound with the 570, the average frame rate doesn't really change and the 1% and 0.1% lows are functionally the same as well. The 580's average frame rate jumps quite a bit and we can see the 2nd gen CPUs being a bit slower than the rest, with the 3rd and 4th gen being on par. Surprisingly, in Vulcan, the 1060's performance overall is about the same as the RX 580. The 1% and 0.1% are pretty consistent between the 3rd and 4th gen with the 2nd gen falling behind. Speaking of the 1650 Super, we get quite a jump over the 1060 and 580 here, less so on the second gen with the 2500 barely seeing an improvement and the 2600 only being slightly better. With the 1070, we're seeing a pretty linear climb overall. The second gen hasn't really changed from the 1650 Super and the third gen is starting to taper off as well. However, the fourth gen is pretty much reaching the limit of the game engine since Doom is capped at 200 FPS, and we're seeing the same with the 1% and 0.1% lows. Moving up to the 1080, and we're really seeing the same story here. Nothing's really changed. With the 1080 Ti, I'd just be a broken record. The 4th gen already capped out the game engine at the 1070, and nothing was going to be gained here. In Far Cry, we can see pretty similar performance across the board on the 570, with the 2nd gen being ever so slightly lower. We already know this is due to a combination of clock speed, IPC, and memory speed from the bottleneck testing. With the 580, we're seeing a decent jump in performance over the 570. The gap widens with the second gen, and the third gen is starting to fall off. We're seeing an overall performance increase across the board generationally for aforementioned reasons. 
The 1060 is a slight jump over the 580, and we're seeing the same trend as we did with the 570. The second gen is falling behind with the third and fourth gen being about the same as far as average frame rates go. However, the third gen really falls behind in the 1% and 0.1% lows. The 1650 Super's performance is all over the place. Well, in Far Cry 5, with the HD textures enabled, you will exceed 4 gigs of VRAM. This forces the game to use the system memory instead, which is considerably slower. Thus, the performance is all over the place. And with them off, we're seeing a similar trend as we did with the 580. But remember, these aren't really comparable to the rest of the results. The second gen is holding the 1650 Super back compared to the third gen, with the fourth gen improving slightly over the third. The 1% and 0.1% lows are more telling. The second gen is much slower, with the fourth gen being a noticeable improvement over the third. With the 1070, we're getting considerable gains from one generation to the next. However, the 1% and 0.1% lows aren't really changing much over the 1060 here. We see very little change with the 1080 from the 1070. There's really no difference overall, save for seeing a slight jump in performance on the average frame rate. And the 1080 Ti might as well be the 1080, with very slight fluctuations in performance overall. Moving to Battlefield 5, and the 570 is seeing a slight climb from CPU to CPU, and we're seeing the same trend with the frame rate consistency, save for the 2500, which is lagging behind. We're seeing the same trend with the 580. There's a decent bump in performance, but that 2500 is lagging even further behind on the frame rate consistency. The 1060 sees lower performance than the 570 here, and all the CPUs have a pretty consistent average frame rate. However, the 2500 is still lagging behind. The 1650 Super manages to beat the 570, at least in average frame rate, but is still falling short of the 580. The average frame rate is pretty close across the board, with the 2500 being slightly behind the rest. And the frame rate consistency is the same trend we saw with the 1060. With the 1070, we cached the 580 on average frame rate, but the 580 was still more consistent, save for the 4790. And surprisingly, the 4690 seems like it might pass up the 3770. The 1080 sees a big jump in average FPS for the 3770, 4690, and 4790. The 2500 really doesn't improve at all, and the 2600 and 3570 don't see much of a jump. The 1080 Ti's performance is quite surprising. Despite what we saw in bottlenecking, we're seeing continued gains from the 4690 as well as the 3770 and 4790. The 2500, 2600, and 3570 remain pretty much unchanged. But what about the 1440p and 4K results? Well, at 1440p, the 1070's average frame rate is pretty much the same. With the 1080, we're seeing the FPS start to fall off on the second gen, with the frame rate consistency starting to level off again between the 3770 and 4690. The 1080 Ti sees a steady climb from the second gen to the fourth gen, with the same story on the 1% and 0.1% lows. And in 2160p, the 1080 Ti is pretty much GPU bound on all of these CPUs. There's not a lot of difference performance wise here, just keep in mind that you need to take bottleneck testing into account with these performance figures. And in Battlefront, the RX 570 is GPU bound here. There's really not much to say. Regardless of which gen you choose, you'll see the same performance. And the same can be said for the 580, almost. The second gen is starting to fall off slightly, and we're seeing almost 120 FPS on all of these CPUs. With the 1060, we're entirely GPU bound again, but our average frame rate drops down to match the 570, and the 1% and 0.1% drop even further. The 1650 Super sees similar performance as the 580 on average frame rate, but falls behind on consistency. The 2500 is really starting to lag behind here. The 1070 hits, and it's quite a jump. We're close to 144 FPS here. Seems the third gen is GPU bound, but the second gen is falling behind overall, the 2500 more so. With the 1080, we're seeing the third gen start to fall off, with the second gen now being able to hit that 144 hertz goodness. Finally, with the 1080 Ti, we see a linear climb from the second gen to the fourth gen. However, now we're seeing the same performance out of the 4690 and 4790 because we've hit the game engine's limit of 200 FPS. Lastly, in Modern Warfare, with the 570, the 2500 is already starting to fall behind the pace, with the 570 really being GPU bound with the rest of the CPUs. With the 580, we're seeing an overall increase over the 570, but as far as our trend is concerned, we're seeing the same story as the 570, but the 2500 is even falling more off the pace.
The 1060's performance is no different either. We're GPU bound past the 2500, but it's not far behind, though the frame rate consistency has taken a slightly worse hit. The 1650 Super doesn't do great here, and that could be because we're nearing that 4GB VRAM limit. However, I never saw it exceed that or saw the system memory increase during testing, and the results were quite consistent. Anyways, the second gen really struggled here compared to the third and fourth gen. The 1070's performance is about the same as the 580 here, and the same trend we've seen for most of the GPUs so far. The 2500 is falling off the pace, with the rest being relatively similar. Moving up to the 1080, and we can hit that higher refresh barrier, save for the 2500 which is lagging way behind now. We can see the extra threads really coming into play here, slotting in that beast of a 1080 Ti, and the 2500 is no different than the 1080, and the 3570 has also fallen off the pace. Not even the 4th gen's IPC boost is going to keep the 3770 from passing up the 4690 here, but it ain't far behind. Not that it makes any sense to put a 4th gen i5 with a 1080 Ti anyways. I will say one last thing though, if you're using this information to decide on a GPU and you skip the bottleneck analysis, go back and watch it, since this can be taken very out of context and is only half the story. Regardless of the performance, you're going to want to have some buffer zone on your CPU usage. This video took me over a month to make. There was a literal crap ton of testing and research that went into it, so that I could make sure that my conclusions were sound. And with that, I stand by my uh, original thoughts in the buyer's guide. And these results only reaffirm that, which was that at nearly the same price, the older models just don't make any sense to me, especially the i5s. I had to spend nearly the same amount for the 9010 that I used for testing as I did the 9020. And I spent over a month prior to testing looking for a 990, and the best deal that I could manage was just under $100. At such a narrow price margin, the 90 series and the 10 series just don't make any sense. I mean, if you find one for an awesome deal, then by all means, but you realize that the i5-4690 is matching and even beating the i7-3770 in some games. I honestly was not expecting that. That iced PC gain really matters, and at a similar price, I don't know why you would settle for less. Not to mention all the other issues that I have with those models, which I go over in the buyer's guide. However, when it comes down to it, you can game on any one of these CPUs in 2020. Some are just more ideal than others. Just be sure to not waste your money on more GPU than you need, and hopefully this video gave you a good idea of what that limit is, regardless of what you go with. So has this video changed your mind? Has it shown you that the difference is more than marginal between these CPUs? Let me know down in the comments. And if you have any questions, leave those down below as well. I do try to answer as many people as I can. Also, if you're looking for an Optiplex community, there is an awesome group on Facebook. This is not my group, but I am a member there. Just go click on the link in the description. If you found this video useful, considering doing all those YouTube things down below, Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.